But as you see here, overcoming the battle within. If you are here today and you are struggling with the handcuffs of, of sin, I want you to know something. You are not alone. You are not alone. You are not the Lone Ranger. Because one of the greatest apostles that ever lived, the Apostle Paul, who actually wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, suffered the same circumstances and issues you and I suffer as well. He had been dealing with a battle that was battling on the inside of him. As a matter of fact, you will find he tells us in Romans chapter 6, and I, I didn't put it up there, so you don't have to turn, you don't have to turn here. I'm just giving you an overview. In Romans chapter 6, Paul tells us, from the moment that we were born on this earth until the time that we are born again, that you accepted Christ, you were born with a sin factory. That sin factory was inside of you. And that sin factory was doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. And that sin factory produced one and only one type of product. And that product was nothing more, nothing less than sin mixed with evil. So, if you were, before you came to know the Lord, you were of an old man, you were of an old nature, you were of a sinful nature. But when you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, Romans chapter 6 tells us that the sin factory was shut down. Say amen. amen. Jesus Christ came and he absolutely annihilated the sin factory. Thank it you. does not exist anymore. Thank you, Lord. Which puts us in a dilemma here this morning. Well, if I, am a, if I am a new creation in Christ, and I'm not the old man, the old sinful nature that I once was, apart from Christ, then why is it that I'm still sinning the way that I sin? Why do I still have all these problems that come and, and sort of uh, reek with my mind and cause me to do things that I know that I shouldn't do? It's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. Because we're going to talk about that this morning. I want us to see the argument that Paul the Apostle brings to our attention. In Romans chapter 7, verse 15. And I really want you, listen, I really want you. Every one of us are sinners. We are all sinners saved by grace. Can you agree with that? Can you agree that you are a sinful, a sinful piece of dust? That's all we are. So if you know that, and God is giving you now an understanding of how to not be entangled by those small little things that keep entangling you, and that's what's going to happen here this morning, you are going to be set free if you do one of, uh, both things, not just hear the Word, but apply the Word. So I want you to take the back of your bulletin, and I want you to become a student of the Word. I want you to take what you're about to hear this morning, and I want you to take it home as I keep on reminding you. And I want you to be one that's going to revisit it and revisit it because you are going to be untangled by all those things that have caused you nothing but misery in your life. Amen? This is what Paul wants for you. He wants you to be set free from all the evil intent that is in your heart. So here in Romans chapter 7, verse 15, Paul is beginning by saying, For what I am doing... I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I don't practice. But what I hate, that I do. Paul says, I can't figure out why, what, why everything is so awry with me. What's going on with me? He said, why do I struggle so bad? And then he turns around and he looks in the mirror and he says, why do I do the things that I know I shouldn't be doing? And why is it the things that I know that I should do why am, I, why am I not doing that? Now that's Paul, the way he's discussing things about himself to himself. Have you ever looked in the mirror after you said something and you got caught and you said, man, why did I say that? You've done something and said, why did I do that? Why did I put my hands to that? Why did I go down that path? Why did I leave last night? Why did I go there and get drunk? What? Whatever. Did you ever come back after all kind of problems? Now the corruption of your, your activity hits you in the face, and now you are feeling incarcerated. Do you ever go before a mirror and say, what's wrong with you? And point at the guy looking back at you. 
What's wrong with you? Why are you that way? Why are you doing the things that you are doing? And actually, if you really think about it, the sinful things you do, you really don't want to do. But you can't control yourself. And so Paul is trying to make some kind of logical sense of this. He's turning around and he says, I go to church. I read the Word. I study the Word. I have my devotions. I love the Lord. God uses me so profoundly. But yet why, why is it that I seem I can't get myself under control? He said, what's wrong with me? So in Romans chapter 7, verse 16, Paul said, if then I do what I will not to do, if I do the things I know that I shouldn't be doing, I agree with the law that the law is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in the flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. Paul said, I understand I'm going wrong. I understand that I want to do what's right and be pleasing to the Lord, but I seem not to be able to do it. And the things that I know that God wants me to do, those are the things I don't do. But the things that are evil, the things that are vile, those are the things, the things that are disgusting, those are the things that I find myself doing. And I don't understand why I am the way that I am. If any of you felt that way, have any of you felt that way? If you say no, then you're lying. That's your biggest sin going on. Amen? Paul's frustrated. He's frustrated because he can't control the inner being of who he is along the way. And he says, he said, I don't know why I do the things that I do. He knows he needs help in this issue, if you will. Amen? Amen. Many people ask the question, wait a minute. We're talking about Paul the Apostle here. Paul the Apostle was a great man. Paul the Apostle wrote, as I repeat, two-thirds of the New Testament. Paul the Apostle was privileged by God to go to, the, go to heaven and see what heaven really was like and never truly have to die to get there, but he's not allowed to talk about it. This is who Paul was. But Paul is but a, say it with me, a man. a man. He's a man. The Bible talks about Elijah and says, Elijah, though he was so powerful, so, uh, so triumphant, that he had many, many miracles come and, and manifest through him. But the Bible says he was a man just like you and me. So when you think about Paul, you come to realize he was a human being. He had all human faults. He had all human frailties and all human failures just like we do. Just like we do. But here he is. He's constantly, he's constantly fighting the issue. Why do I do the things that I do and the things that I know that I should be doing I don't do. Why is that? Because the closer you get to the Lord, the more sensitive you will be to your faults. The closer you get to the Lord, the more sensitive you will become about your failures. When you take a true Christian, a true sold out converted Christian that is on fire for the things of God, they are yet, yes, they're on fire for Christ, but they are human beings. And they are going to have failure. They're going to have times where they trip up because we are all sinners saved by grace. They're going to have the same problem as a carnal Christian. A carnal Christian, the difference between a carnal Christian and a spiritual Christian, a carnal Christian, they come a dime a dozen. You'll find them in most all churches around the world. They come into the church. You don't see them all the time. They come into the church. They don't re really read the Word on a daily basis. They really don't pray. They don't have a close, intent relationship with the Lord. They are religiously bound. They go through religious motions. And they don't pain. They don't suffer when they make mistakes and they do something that they should not be doing, in essence, against the things of God. That doesn't bother them. The only time that they ever suffer, the only time that they ever feel the pain of it, is when they get caught. But when you look at a Christian, a true Christian, when they are trying and striving with a fire of, a, uh, of a, a tenacity to serve the Lord, and when they fail, the difference is, no one else has to know that they messed up. But they are so grieved in their heart 
because they're so sensitive to the conviction of the Holy Spirit that brings their failure before them. Amen? Well, Paul the Apostle, here's, his, here's where he's saying, I want to do what is right before my God. I want to be online with His will, but I can't seem to get there at times because I feel like I am shackled. I feel like I am handcuffed. And I can't do the things that I know that I should do. So here, in verse 23, he says this, But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. And it's so serious, it's so mind-boggling, it doesn't happen once in a while. It doesn't just happen what, you know, every so often, but it comes about upon me day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. And I find myself that I am absolutely losing my mind. I'm losing my mind because of this battle. It's driving me crazy. Driving me crazy. Well, you know, when I look at some of you on any given Sunday, Everybody smile. Let me know that you're alive. When I look at some of you, I wanted you to smile for a reason. On any given Sunday, because if, a, if, a, if a, uh, somebody dies in the church one day, and they have to come in to get the body, I don't want them to take all of you away before they find the right body. But anyhow. <laughs> all of you, at times you smile, you laugh, you, you, you know, you're singing, you're dancing, arms raised. You look so holy to me sometimes when I'm playing the piano. That I believe, you know, that you supersede the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If God were to take us, we, some of you would go zipping right past them. You're holier than them because you look even more holy than they do. Okay, that's the kind of expression that you have on the outward. But and the truth is, you love the Lord. You come here, and I pray that you're getting fed. I pray that, pray that you're growing. You have your hands raised. You're praising Him, worshiping Him. You're hearing the revelation from Him. And that's all beautiful. But the moment you leave here, and you go out and get in your car, the beast begins to rise. The beast inside of you begins to rise. And then all of a sudden you say, well, wait a minute. I was in church. I was praising. I was dancing. I was singing. I loved the Lord. I heard a beautiful sermon. I was, I was really involved. I was really enjoying it. What's going on with me now? Why is it I can't control my mouth? Why is it I can't control my anger? Why is it I can't control my lust? Why is it I can't control my addiction? Why can't I control all these things? Whereas I'm in church, I'm doing the right thing, I leave church, and all hell breaks loose on me. And I just fall prey to it. I can't seem to stop myself. Well, why is that? If the source is that I've become a new creation in Christ, that I'm a born-again believer, I have, I have accepted Christ, and therefore He's alive and well, residing within me, so why is it I have no control over the sinful nature of my life? The answer? Because the new you moved into an old house. The new you is in an old house. Paul brings it to our attention in verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For I know that, verse 18 says, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Paul says, you know why we struggle? Because we're still living in this flesh. Now this is very important. When I talk about flesh, I'm not speaking flesh in reference to the sinful nature. The sinful nature is the makeup of, of the sin factory. The sin factory died at the moment you accepted Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came, he eradicated the sin factory. But unfortunately, we are living in a contaminated body called the flesh. And let me show it to you. Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead and indeed to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, your old man, your old man is dead. Why? Because Romans chapter 6 verse 6 says that our old man was crucified with him. So in other words, the sin factory that you were born with, it's called the original sin of Adam and Eve, 
And what it did, it produced, it produced, it produced, it produced more and more and more and more sin. Over and over and over again. And then one day you accepted Christ. And when you accepted Christ, he came and he just shut that sin factory down. So because the sin factory is shut down, you become a new creation in the reality of it. But the flesh doesn't benefit from it. The flesh doesn't benefit from it at all. So what's going on here? Here's what's happening. When the sin factory was shut down, all the sins that had a myriad of sins that had accumulated in your life. They had to go somewhere because the factory's gone. So where did they go? They kind of plotted themselves. They kind of, they kind of uh, set themselves, the stockpile of sin, in your flesh. They're right here in your flesh. And, th and that, those sins are still there. And they're still meandering. They're still messing with you. They're still messing with your brain. Still messing with your, uh, your, your outward uh, uh, desires. Those things that you still remember. How much fun you used to have. If I did this, when I did that. And then you all of a sudden, you still have the remembrance of the sins. And those sins, and there are a plethora of them, they are lodged in your flesh. They are lodged in your flesh. And even though the <clears throat> sin factory doesn't exist anymore, you are still carrying the residual of the sins that you accumulated up until the point you got saved. You following me on this? It would be like kind of General Motors. General Motors manufactures vehicles. There are certain cars you may buy that they don't manufacture anymore. Maybe you have a, G a GM car in your garage you're paying for it or it's paid off, but they don't manufacture that car anymore. Does that mean that you don't see the car anymore? No. The car is there. It's in the garage. It's in your garage. You might have paid it off. But they don't manufacture that type of car anymore. But it doesn't mean that all those cars they manufactured don't exist out there until they rot back to the earth. You still have them. Well, that's how it is with the sins in your life. The sin factory has been destroyed by Christ. But all those sins that were produced in your life before you got saved are now lodged in your flesh. And Paul says, in Romans chapter 6, verse 6 again, he said, that old man was crucified with him. He said, that the body of sin might be done away with. In other words, all the sin that you've accumulated, all the sins you created before salvation, they are in the flesh. And we come to find that God had given Paul the divine revelation of saying, and that body, he says here, it might be done away with. It might be done away with. How many of you know the flesh is not welcome in heaven? Your flesh body, when you die, you are going to leave this mortal body, this fleshly body called the tent. You are going to leave this body and you are going to have a supernatural, immortal body that you are going to be with the same kind of positioning or the same kind of uh, body as Christ. But this mortal body is not welcomed in heaven because this mortal body, this fleshly body, is contaminated with the lodging of all the sins that have lodged in the body. Amen? So you come to find that's the reason why we are to take a child and teach them the ways of the Lord when they are young because if you can get them early to accept Christ, then they won't have all this all this baggage of sin that they will have accumulated in their life that is going to cause temptation, that is going to constantly try to get them to go back to the old behavior, the old ways. So we find in chapter 7, verse 23, Paul goes on and says, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into the captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. He goes and shows the distinction. I want you to see it here. The law of sin and the law of the mind. The law of sin resides in the flesh. But I want you to know, sin does not reside in the mind. Up until a point. And I'll explain that. And I'm going to hold that right there. I want you to remember that. And I want you to hold on to it because we're going to close on that argument. Okay? But I want to show you something very important. 
I want you to see what Paul wants you to see here. Paul wants you to know that sin is so sneaky. It uses the law to trip you up. It uses God's word to trip you up. Because he says here in verse 11, chapter 7, verse 11, he says, For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Let's read the rest of it first. Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. He then has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good. I want to take the first part of it. Verse 11. He said, For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. I like what the NIV says. It says, Sin seizing the opportunity, the opportunity through the law caused me by the law to be put to death. Kind of hard to understand? Let me make it easy. Did you ever say to a child, don't you touch this again? I, I, see, my, I see my daughter saying that, my <laughs> wife saying that to poor Jace. You do that again, I'm going to spank you. Don't you do that again, right? You think Jace will never touch it again? No. Huh? Any of your children ever listened after one time? No. No, you turn around and you've, you've given them a law. You've given them a law. And you know what they're going to do? Mommy's not looking. <laughs> you say, that's crazy. Well, that's what God did with Adam and Eve. God did with Adam and Eve. He said, listen, you can eat any of the fruit of any of the trees in the garden, but don't touch that one in the middle. That's mine. That's a tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't you touch it, because the day that you touch it, surely you will die. He gave them a law. He told them, do not touch. We go to Genesis chapter 3, and it says that the angel, uh, Satan himself came into the garden, and I don't believe it was all that hard for Satan to lure them to look at the fruit, because they were already studying the tree of knowledge, because they so badly were tantalized by the law that said, don't touch it. And it didn't take, didn't take much for Satan to get them to say, look at the fruit. God didn't really mean you're going to die. He just means that you're going to be like him. You're going to know all things, good and evil. And they ate it. What happened to them? They died. Not immediately, but they would have never died. They, would have, they were created in a state of utopia. They would have lived forever and ever and ever. But because they touched the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they broke the law that God gave them. Because of that, they began to die. You say, how stupid were they? How stupid were they? Well, let me ask you a question. You adults, you're walking in a park. You see a sign on a wet painted bench, wet paint. Do not touch. How many of you, how many of you have gone and looked at that bench and looked around? Anybody? You can't help yourself. You can't help yourself because you have been given a rule, a command, a law. Do not touch. Paul said, I never had any offense come my way until the law said, do not. When the law said, do not, then all of a sudden something inside of me said, I want to. So that's what it means. Sin seizing the opportunity to see me and through the law put me to death. The law came, and sin caused me to be agitated by it. So here's what Paul's saying. Sin piggybacks on the law so as to get you to fulfill. That way he can provoke his agenda. He gets you to follow his persuade so that he can provoke his agenda. That's what, that's what sin does. Amen? It piggybacks. And so... Paul says here that we, in verse 17, again, we carry the residuals of the sin factor in our body. He said, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. He said, when I fall short and I say something I'm not supposed to be saying, I do something I'm not supposed to be doing, or I go where I'm not supposed to be going, or I put my hand to something I'm not supposed to, it's not my fault. He said, I've come to realize it's not my fault, not my responsibility. Because he said in verse 20, he said, it's sin 
There's sin dwelling in me. If I do what I want, to, I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it. But he said in verse 20, but it's sin that dwells in me. When I think those thoughts and I say those things and I go those, to those bad places, it's not me. Am I giving you a, a lease of freedom here? I hope not. <laughs> because I'm messing with you. <laughs> he said, it's not me. It's what's going on inside of me. It's going on, what's going on inside of me. He said, when you see me, you see two people. You see the new me, the newly created me in Christ, and he won't do anything to go against the will of God. But then there is the sinful nature in me. He's the one that's doing it. So not only do you have to know that you have two people, but you have to understand who you are now. You, if you accepted Christ, you are redeemed. You are, you are a new creation. You are, you are sanctified. You are holy. You are righteous. That's who you are. Unfortunately, you are still living in the flesh. And the flesh body is the one that holds on to all the sins that are going on inside of you. So with that, you say, well, you know what? If Paul can get away with it, and say, it's no longer I, but it's sin in me that's causing me to behave this way, then that means I'm free of all responsibility. That's why I do the things that I do. Well, let me show you something. Look at Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. He said, if you knew well, God speaks to Cain here. He says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. You should master over it. Now what God is saying, and he's saying it to, to Cain, but he's also telling you and I, he says, listen, there is this lion. He gives us the understanding of sin as like that of a lion. There's a lion that is at the door. It's in a crouched down position, and it's looking to pounce on you. And it wants to rule over you. And this lion, anybody remember, remember what the Word of God says about our enemy? He's like a roaring lion, searching to and fro, looking for whosoever he may devour. Do you know a lion in Africa? They don't go after just any prey because they don't want to waste energy and they don't want to waste time. They're hungry. So what do they look for? They look for the weakest. They look for the youngest of the herd. That's who they go after. So sin pounces on those who are weak. It waits like a lion, it encroaches, and it will pounce on you when you are weak. How could you be weak? He goes after those carnal Christians who do not read the Word, they don't have the Word in them, they don't, they don't walk with the Lord, they don't pray to the Lord, they don't have a relationship with the Lord, and there again in Ephesians chapter 6, you come to find you don't have the full armor of God on you. Satan looks for the weaklings. He looks for those that he can pounce on ever so quickly. And that's the ones that he goes after. That's what sin does. But who's behind the direction of sin? Ultimately, it is the master of sin, Satan himself. Satan is the one that knows every, every, everything about each and every one of us. He has a game film. I told you this last week or so. He has a game film on us. He knows every tendency of your life. And your behavior, he has it grafted because our behavior continues on, in patterns. We do certain things at certain times and he sees our tendencies. Your sinful display is patterned. It's etched in your heart. It's etched right there. Because of who you were all your life before you got saved. So there's a pattern of tendency. Satan knows the small little thing that so easily entangles you. So what does he do? What does he do? He waits until he can get you alone on that lonely moment on a mount of temptation. He won't attack you while you're praising and worshiping in church. <coughs> while you're here with the saints of God, while you're here feeling very content and secure. You don't get assaulted here. 
You will get assaulted out there all by yourself, not with your family, not with a couple, not with another person. You, he will wait until he gets you alone. Until he gets you alone. And so what is his strategy? His strategy is the power of suggestion. He will start to whisper in your ear. And he will start to put these little thoughts in your, in your heart. He'll say to you, you don't have to go to church today. Come on. That's too long. You worked all the way through the weeks and you had to work on Saturday. You want to get up to go to church? You deserve a break today. Get up and get away to McDonald's. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to go to church. And that tithe, don't give your money to the church. Take that money, compile it, and go and entertain yourself. Go to a football game. Go to a hockey game. Go and spend all your money on you. Don't give God what deserves, what God says he deserves, what he demands. Don't do that. And he will put all these thoughts, all these thoughts in your mind, all these suggestions. And along the way, you're thinking they're your thoughts. They're your suggestions. But I want you to know they're up here. That's where he hits you, up here. Sin is not in the mind. Sin is in the flesh. But if you ponder on it, if you think about it long enough, then sin is in the mind because now you come to find as a man thinks, so he shall be. Amen? You think about something long enough, you are going to, you are going to put your hand and it's going to manifest. It's going to manifest. So what do we do? Paul said, when those thoughts come, if I take them and I actually manifest my thoughts, I've taken the suggestion of Satan and I've adopted it in my own life. And now it has become sin. You don't want it to go that far. Here's the secret of your life. We are told in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse, verse 5, we are to take every thought captive to make it obedient to Jesus Christ. Every thought, whatever it is that's coming your way, a sinful thought, don't act on it, don't ponder on it. Take it and give it over to Jesus. And give it over to the one who knows how to set you free. Amen. Now why do we give it over to him? Because Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. He, does, he can sympathize with your temptations. He sympathizes when the enemy assaults you. But it says, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points, all ways, tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus never sinned. You know how bad it was for him? You take the full compilation of every temptation of all human beings throughout the world, past, present, and future, all the compilation of every temptation, Satan took those temptations and he threw them on, on Jesus. He tried to get him to act out what was going on up here. Jesus immediately brought them under obedience to himself. I want you to know that when you take that thought, when you take that, that struggling addiction, when you take those things where you say it's out of control, don't try to fight it yourself, don't try to do it yourself. All you do is say, Jesus, I need to give this to you. I need to give this to you. When you begin to give it to him and you pray and you thank him and you're reading the word, those thoughts will be gone. Amen. Because little by little, you are going to find, you are going to take the, the sins that have been created by the sin factory that are now lodged in your flesh, little by little, you're going to escort them out and they're going to be destroyed. As they come up, you take them, you give them the Christ, the, uh, to Jesus Christ, the very one who destroyed the sin factory, will destroy that addiction. He will destroy that weakness. He will destroy that thought. He will destroy that sin. And those sins won't come back to you. They won't come back to you because you have overcome. You have overcome that battle that is there within you at that time. Can you say amen? amen. amen. So Paul... Paul basically, was Paul lets us know that Jesus was never, 
He, even though he was tempted greatly, he never sinned. So in verse 24, what is the solution? Paul said, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Paul starts out with a statement of hopelessness. Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? He's not referring to the inner man, the new man. He's referring to the flesh that's comprised of the lodging of all this sin. Who is going to, who's going to set me free from this? Who's going to get me out of this? Because, see, in, in Romans chapter 7, you come to find at the onset, Paul was trying to fix himself. Paul was trying to say, things that I do, I, I don't want to do. The things that I know that I should do, those are the things that I don't do. And the things that I know that I, 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 I can't do, those are the things that I find myself putting my hand to and doing. Who can, who can help me from this? Who can help me from this? So Paul, Paul is coming to a place where he's realizing, I can't fix me. There's got to be somebody that can help me because I've been struggling with this for a long, long time and it's not seeming to go away. My evil thoughts, my temptation, it's overwhelming me. It's taking over me. But he goes on and he makes a statement. He says, who can save me from this body of death? Isn't that a crazy statement? <coughs> who can save me from this body of death? Now we look at that and we say, well, what's he talking about? But if you lived in Paul's day, you'd know exactly what he was talking about. In Paul's day, they were under the rule and reign, all of Israel was under the rule and reign of Rome. The Roman government was made up of some maniacal characters. They had some maniac laws. And here's one of the laws. If you killed somebody, Rome would take the dead body, the carcass that you killed, and they would strap that body to you, and they would put that body in such a way as they wrapped it around you and carried it up over your shoulders so that you would be able to see the face of that carcass 24-7. For a long period of time. So here it is. You killed somebody, whether it was a, an accident or whether it was, you know, that you purposely killed them. Rome didn't just kill you back. No, they made you suffer. They made you go through it. They would take the carcass and put that carcass right there in front of you. So now you have the heat of the, of the desert. You have all the storms that come with it. So that carcass is going to start to disintegrate. It's going to start to rot. Amen? And they would let you have that body for at least a month or two. Not a couple days. And that body would begin to rot. It would start to decay. Here comes the maggots. Here comes the flies. Here comes the, the, the rodents that come out of it. And the reason why they did that, because in time, diseases would permeate from the body and the, stent, the pungent odor would be more than you can handle, but the diseases would then jump on you, and you would, you would eventually die from the diseases that came infectiously from the dead body. Isn't that crazy? You're glad you're living today, right? <laughs> but Paul's saying, who can help me? Who can take care of this dead body that's going to infect me, that's going to kill me? that's going to destroy me. He doesn't know what to do. I've tried everything I can think of. I can't stop myself. I can't stop my addictions. I can't stop my addictive nature. That, because I'm living in this stinking flesh. And it's sin. It's in me. It's causing it. But I know that I still have to have responsibility. I can't blame it on sin. I've got to get some, I've got to get some control to who I am in Christ. So what does he say? Here comes verse 25. Verse 25, he says it with a loud shout. He says it with a praise on his, on, his, on his lips. He turns around and he says it with the knowledge of liberation is about to come. Then he turns around and he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Verse 24, he was downcast. Verse 24, he's in a place of rejecting. I don't have any strength. I'm not going to get out of this. But then it came to him. I thank God for my Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to do something that I've never thought of before. If sin is piggybacking on the law that's causing me to be deceived and to be destroyed, I'm going to piggyback on the nature of Christ. I'm going to piggyback on God's love. I'm going to piggyback on His obedience. I'm going to piggyback on the obedience of Christ on the righteousness of Christ. 
on the holiness of Christ. Therefore, whenever the enemy comes and he pounces on me, sin tries to overtake me, I'm going to now piggyback on Jesus. I'm going to stay right with him. I'm not going to get away from him. I am going to let my mind not become my mind anymore. I'm going to have the mind of Christ. How do you get the mind of Christ? You have the word of God in your heart. You surround yourself with the word. You read the word. You praise the Lord. Religion, listen to me. If you are into religion, let me tell you where you're going. You're not going anywhere. When they asked Jesus about the Pharisees, he said, leave them alone. They're not mine. They're not mine. And they were the mighty men of integrity, holy religious integrity. <coughs> Jesus came and said, you're nothing more than, uh, than, than white tombstones. You're the blind leading the blind. That's all you are. You go through your parliament of religious traditionalism. Christ isn't looking for religious traditionalism. He's looking for a relationship. He's looking for, he created you in his image. He wants you to be formed and transformed into his likeness. That only comes when you read his word and you absorb his word in your heart and you are living for him, no longer living for you. That's why uh, 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 David said, I, I hide your word in my heart that I shall not sin against you. You can't back away from the sinful nature if you don't have the word in your heart. The word in your heart is the living word of Jesus Christ. It will rise up to the forefront, and that's how you give it over to Jesus, and he will erase it out of your mind. Therefore, you don't put your hand to something, and it becomes nothing more than sin. Because if you die in unconfessed sin, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. You've got to ask for forgiveness of sin. I can't say you won't make it to heaven. You won't be used of God because you will be stalemated right where you're at. You will be stalemated until you confess that sin. Because God is so holy that he will not cross over sin to come and love upon you. That sin has become a blockade. You need to let that sin go. So if you have problems with, you know, the conversation, your mouth is, your, your tongue is wagging and you're, uh, you're using foul language, or you're yelling at people, or you're addicted, or you're whatever the case, you have lust in your heart, do not, do not carry it out. You take it, you piggyback on Jesus Christ, you give it over to Him, because ultimately, He wants you and I to be set free. Can you say amen? amen. This, did I get this across to you with great understanding for you to understand? There is a way to be set free from your sins. Amen? Amen? With every head bowed. Every head bowed. I'm going to ask. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Do you truly, <laughs> truly know Him? And I don't mean religiously. I don't mean, oh, I read the Bible once in a while about Him. I go to church and they, they speak about Him. But did you ever, ever on your own intimate time, get on your face before him and say, Jesus, I need to ask you into my life that you would become my Lord and my Savior, that I am a sinner and I can't save myself through my own attempts. I can't get to heaven on my own. And I can't even get to heaven through religion and the religious organization that I belong to. But I can only get there by confessing you into my life, that you would come and you would eradicate that sin factory that has been there for a long, long time. Lord, I'm asking that as I am a sinner, I want to be saved by your immeasurable grace. So I'm asking that I want to just lift up my heart and give my life over to you this very moment that you would become my Lord and my Savior. Not just my Savior, but you would become my Lord. You would be the master of my life. That sin will not master over me any longer, but you, I give the freedom to master over me. If that's you, I just want you to just raise your hand. You don't have to lift up your head or anything. Just raise your hand that you want to accept the Lord as your Lord and Savior here this morning. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Anyone else? Okay, you put your hand up. 
Now I say it again. I say it again. Going to a religious organization does not, it's not proof pudding that you're saved. Going through, going through the old behavior of religiosity is not God's way of salvation. Jesus said, I, and only I, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but through me. So I say it one more time. If you don't know if you are truly saved, and you have been sitting under the disguise of religion, this is your opportunity. This is your opportunity. If you want to accept Christ, raise your hand. We're going to have a sinner's prayer. And you can be one that's going to receive it. You're going to receive Him as Lord and Savior. So let's all say it together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for having given your Son, Jesus Christ, that He died on the cross for all mankind, and especially for me. I want to take advantage of His saving grace. And I want to recognize at this moment, I can't make it to heaven through my own attempts my own religious philosophies. So I bow my heart to you, Lord Jesus. And I ask that you come into my life this day. Take over. Not only are you my Savior, but Lord, I want you to be my Lord. I want you to Lord over my life. Be the master of my existence. And I thank you, Jesus, that from this day forward, I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. All things pass away, and all things will become anew. Amen. 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 Now, if you are in need for prayer, I'm going to ask you to come up. Put some music on. If you are in need for prayer, I'm going to ask you to come up. I'm going to pray with you very quickly.